if you run into constraints where you're told that you shouldn't do things a certain way or you can't do things a certain way, and that is completely contrary to your leadership ethos, then you might have to vote with your feet. That's okay too. Em, fantastic to have you back on the mic and great to be back in the ACAST studio. I love this joint. It's awesome. Yes, it's so good. And I just love doing these Q&As in person. It is just not quite the same over Zoom. It's still good, but yeah, this takes the cake. I love it. Yeah. And I think people have to come to terms with that because nothing is the same over Zoom. We know that. And people ask me all the time, you know, well, you know, what's the technique here? How do I, how do, I do this when I'm leading over Zoom? And I look at them, I say, oh, you can't. You can't do it over Zoom because you can't see enough of the nuances in facial expressions and body language and everything else that you need when you're in this type of conversation. So it's always going to be second best. You just got to suck it up. It's a substitute, but it's not good enough for some of the really hard leadership work. And that's why I think you should move back to Australia. I will in due course. <laughs> <laughs> just, just using that to back up my vote. I <laughs> All right. So today we are covering a really interesting topic and I want you to start this episode with a story. And this is, we were discussing this particular story. We were going, this is really common. What can we make that will help people through this? So I want you to take it away and then we'll, we'll go to the questions from there. Yeah. Thanks, Em. Look, we see this happening all the time when we run our cohorts of leadership beyond the theory, particularly the live cohorts where we have, you know, 300 odd leaders from all over the world from different organizations and industries, because when we're running them for corporations directly doing those private cohorts, people tend not to talk too much about the boss and the boss's commitment and all that sort of stuff. But people increasingly, as the course goes on, keep telling us, this stuff is awesome. This stuff absolutely works, but I can't get my boss to buy in. Now, sometimes this happens at module one, right? Because right at the, the corner and the center of everything we do is value. So we talk about, you know, getting the work program in the right shape, having it match the strategic intent of the organization and the value drivers. And sometimes they'll go to the boss and the boss will say, that looks hard. Just go and do as you were told. Yeah. Just go and do what your resources are allocated to in the budget. And that's, uh, you know, a pretty, a pretty sad thing to happen when someone's out there learning how to lead much better and to create more value. And then the first thing they say to their boss, they get a bucket of cold water thrown over them. <laughs> so specifically the, the art and skill of being able to navigate the existing corporation while you're making change from below is tricky. And that's a great thing to dedicate this episode to. Yeah, it's, it is a really uh, kind of tough thing to maneuver. So let's start with what do we do if we're a leader and we're being challenged by this, our boss just does not want to budge. What they know is what they know and they're just going to keep leading that way, hell or high water. Well, I guess the first thing is, uh, as no bullshit leaders, you will be taking accountability for yourself and taking that accountability seriously. Mm. Charity starts at home. So instead of becoming the victim and saying, oh, poor me, my boss won't let me do what I think I should be doing, the onus is on you to be able to communicate with your boss in a way that helps them to understand what the benefits of change are going to be. And everyone's the same, whether you're talking about someone above you, below you, beside you. They don't want to change fundamentally. And unless you can provide really compelling reasons and demonstrate you know, really clear benefits to making the change, then why would they? Mm. That's not on them, that's on you. You've got to be able to communicate this stuff. So I spoke about you know Delivering Value, our first module, which has all of the tools you need to really get a crack at, you know, how do I get the work program into the right shape so that I'm working on the right things, so that my team isn't spinning its wheels, so that they feel as though they're making progress, and so that we're actually delivering results. The one thing that overrides everything else is results. And when your team starts to produce incredible results, people are going to pay attention. And they'll start asking you, how did you do that? What are you doing differently? How come you were able to do that when none of my other teams have? Okay. So the onus is on you. You're accountable for making that change and making that change within your team, I'm assuming. So sure. you just do this within your team? Is that what you're saying? Generally. I mean, you know, the only, well, to the extent that you do have control, the only thing you control is the people who report to you hierarchically in your organization. But 
as you get really good at this stuff, and this, even though it feels hard, is the thing that really hones your leadership skill, doing this type of work, trying to get alliances with peers who have a different set of KPIs, different demands from different bosses sometimes, and being able to demonstrate to them that if they get on board with you, you together can create something special. Now, this is, this is an incredible way to learn how to influence better, communicate better, uh, drive better results, and to then collectively get uh, this, this coalition of the willing behind you in the organisation. Start with your team. That's the only thing you, you know, theoretically control. And if you can convince your peers as well, then that's going to go a long way. Okay. So is it actually possible, though, to uphold a new standard or a high standard within your team when the company culture is not aligned. You know, I'm assuming if your boss isn't aligned, probably the whole company culture is a little bit, how's your father? So is it actually possible to do this? Uh, the short answer is yes, but it's quite difficult. You have to create an island of excellence in your team. Now, let me explain how this is done because it's not intuitively obvious. When you come into any organisation, because it was there before you, most cases, you have a look around and you decide where the level of performance is now and where you want it to be, ideally. You don't have to get permission from your boss to do that. You don't have to get consistency with your peers, although people will try and tell you, you do. Mm. You know, why do we have to do this when that team over there doesn't? Why are we setting higher standards in our team than they are in their team? And the answer to that is simply... What sort of team do we want to be? Do we want to be a mediocre team of also rans, or do we want to be a high performing team that achieves brilliant results and we feel good about that? Do you want to be on a winning team? Well, that's us. That's who we are. And I've actually taken executive roles in organisations where I've gone into the team and had exactly that conversation, you know, and moving, moving say a group of a thousand people to a different attitude and approach to how they do their work is quite tricky. And particularly in the first six months of one, one job I went into, I remember a number of years ago, I must have had about a third of that team, that was the team of about a thousand people, about a third of that team defect to other teams in the organisation. So they're ringing all their contacts that they'd known for 20 or 30 years saying, have you got a job for me? I've got to get out from here. This is no fun. And so that's fine, right? That's what you want. You want people who don't want to subscribe to what you're bringing in terms of change and excellence. You don't want them there. You want them to move. You want them to be in a place where they're happier, they're more comfortable doing things the way they do them. And you have the people who actually want to be on board in being in a high-performing team. So high-performing teams start with high-performing individuals. You can't create that without some attrition. And you need to be looking for the right skills, capabilities, and values to bring into the team. And it's a, a long process. It takes a period of time. But that's absolutely possible within your team, even though it's not the cultural norm across the whole organisation. Yeah, it's what we talk about often, desirable and undesirable turnover. Absolutely. I feel like that goes <laughs> totally. into the desirable turnover yes, area. Yes, it does. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's assume that we've tried to do that within our team. Um, no traction is being made. Is this what we call a constraint of the job? Well, it can be. I think, I think constraints of the job come when uh, you are physically limited from doing things that you know you need to be doing. Here's a good example. I do know organisations where they have a policy, it's not a, not a law, a policy where they choose to keep everyone and won't sack anyone for underperformance or bad behaviour. That's their policy. Hmm. And uh, particularly some government-owned organisations I've seen where they will actually support hiring more and more people so that they can reduce unemployment. It's the government mandate that comes through to some of the companies. Wow. And so you can see you know, metrics where they're reporting on how many new people did you hire? What was your attrition rate and how many people did you bring on board? Are your numbers growing? I, I shit you not. This is a true story, right? <laughs> Creating more and more jobs for more people who, who don't have work to do. And so this was you know, one policy. Now, to work in an organisation like that, you don't really have any option. You've got to follow that policy position. Now, I know that that is patently stupid. And so if I was offered a job in an organisation like that at the CEO level or chairman of the board, I would absolutely say no. It is not the sort of company that I want to be in because I'm all about performance, making things better, stretching people, seeing them shine and grow and build their self-esteem and create some outstanding results. 
and you simply can't do it in that context. So that would be a, a rare but you know an obvious constraint of the job. But it could be anything. Like you, you can get constraints in you know not enough funding, not enough not enough skills. Uh, you, there are all sorts of constraints that you find, or your boss might be a brutal micromanager who just mm. can't get out of your knitting. So common. And that's a constraint of the job because you know you can't get the freedom to operate the way you want to and make the decisions that are really part of your job spec. So, you know, lots of constraints um, and you've got to basically work out whether you can live with them or not. All right. So a question that I've got after hearing you go through all of that is how can you actually, I suppose, neutralise the negative impacts of a boss or a board who are trying to, I guess, stop you from doing what, what you want to do with your team? Uh, that's a great question, Em, because I love the word neutralise. Uh, sometimes you won't be able to get the unequivocal support of your boss or of the board, but you want them to at least uh, allow you to do what you think you need to do to make the team run better. Now, there are a range of ways that this interference can come. I always like to think about interference in the work program because this is so common. Quite often, someone above you is going to push some work down to you and say, please get this done. When you already have all of your resources fully deployed, it happens every single day because there are always things coming onto the agenda that are new. And so part of neutralizing that problem, that dynamic, is to make sure that you're really, really clear on the things you are doing and that you can articulate to your boss, hey, look, here's the things we're doing, here's why we're doing them, and here's why we agreed that they were the best way to use the resources that we have. Now, if we want to do something else, hey, that's awesome, but let's think about what it does to our existing program and where it fits in, what we deprioritize, which things are going to be at risk, and, and make sure we're comfortable with that. So you move that conversation from a you to a we. If, if my boss comes to me and says, Marty, I want you to do this, and I say, can't do it, boss, then I just look like I'm obstructive and lazy. Mm. But if I say, love to do it, hey, let's work out how this fits in and make sure that we're conscious and deliberate about what we're deprioritizing, then that works much better. And quite often, that's a good way to say no. You never have to say the word no, but you just basically lead your boss through the problem of not enough resources to do the things that you're asking us to do. And so that can neutralize it really well. And there's all sorts of ways that you know bosses come down. Some of them micromanage and you have to find a way to push them out of your space. There's a whole range of things. But you know, ultimately, if, if it persists, it's a constraint of your job that you need to decide whether you can live with or not. So understanding the value that your team has to deliver and how that fits into the organization's bigger picture, that's pretty important. It is everything. That's, that's the starting point for everything. It's the source of your ability to produce extraordinary results. It's the source of your ability to protect your team from overwork and burnout. It has so much that just sits in that one thing of making sure that everything you work on is delivering the most value it possibly can and then only doing that, simplicity and focus. You get that right, then everything from there becomes much, much easier. And of course, this is why this is module one of Leadership Beyond the Theory, mm. deliver value. Get that right, and everything that follows is inordinately easier. Okay, Marty, that's really helpful. What about your peers? When you start doing extraordinary things and you start standing out, there's always the tall poppy syndrome. What if they start getting a bit jealous or resentful of the way that you're performing? I mean, that's a great point because you can almost predictably see that happen every time. The higher up you go, the trickier it gets because the people who are up there at the high levels of organisations are all quite resilient. They've been around the block and most of them have learned to some degree to manage and leverage politics. Now, to my detriment, I think, um, I tried to work in almost complete unawareness of the politics around me. I just figured if I did a great job, led a great team and achieved outstanding results, that that would be enough. Mm. But I got derailed a couple of times by you know political attacks that were happening against me behind my back uh, that did change the shape of the way I was viewed inside an organisation. So it is a risk that you have to be aware of. I think nothing succeeds like success. That's still the number one principle. But you will draw the crabs. Like there will be politics and there will be people who would rather see you not do as well as you're doing because it can get quite competitive when you've got a lot of ambitious people wanting to get the next promotion. So just be aware of that. Uh, it shouldn't change the way you do things. You still need to be true to yourself and the way you want to lead. But, you know, be aware of the politics and make sure that you understand 
where the risks are coming from because you know a stakeholder who's not aligned with you can absolutely derail your efforts. Yeah, super interesting. We do get a lot of questions about how to manage stakeholders and how to manage those office politics. So uh, we can cover that in another Q&A episode because I think there's so much to pull apart there. You've done a great job on this episode, Marty. Thank you so much for Thanks, digging Ed. in with me. No worries. Uh, wrap, do you want to take us out? Yeah, I think um, I think just to wrap up on what we've covered, I mean, this this concept of having people above you who don't actually get it and support you the same way you'd like them to is really about managing the situation. So start with yourself, make sure that you're accountable for communicating, for influencing and for managing, right? You're the one who's got to change the people around you. You can't expect them to decide to change. That means you've got to be able to demonstrate the benefits of doing things differently. Uh, then, of course, you have to think about building an island of excellence. Now, not everyone in your team is going to want to be part of that. That's okay. You don't want them working for you either. You want them working for someone who is going to set a lower standard and be more tolerant of underperformance. Let them go there. They'll be happy. The other leader will be happy. And you can bring the people who do want to do the job, who do want to play on a winning team and who do want to achieve results and feel as though they're going forward and having an impact. So, so don't expect everyone to be on board. Uh, make sure that the people above you are at least neutral, at least don't want to stop you from doing the things you're doing. That's quite important. They don't have to be raving supporters, but they do need to at least let you go. And if you run into constraints where you're told that you shouldn't do things a certain way or you can't do things a certain way, and that is completely uh, contrary to your leadership ethos, then you might have to vote with your feet. That's okay too. As long as you're in the fight, as long as you're doing the hard things, that are going to help you to be better, then that's a, a, a win every day of the week, regardless of what your boss says or regardless of what the organisation tries to force you into. Great wrap, Marty. Thank you so much. And I'll chat with you soon. Thanks, Em. Been a great pleasure. Thanks.